As long as I'm president of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes sea. a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold your fire. A podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley. And I am Naz Modirzadeh. Welcome to this new episode of Hold Your Fire. Today, the main topic of our discussion is going to be about Libya, and I'm delighted to have our senior analyst for Libya, Claudia Gazzini, who's been going or living on and off in Libya for the last decade and more. So we'll get to that. But before we do, let's, uh, Naz, review a bit of what's happened this week. Yes, Rob. So a number of events once again this week, um, including the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the United States Supreme Court. I know that you knew her personally and wondered if you could maybe say a few words about her. Well, it really was my wife, Caroline, who uh, who knew her. She Well, Justice Ginsburg, then Judge Ginsburg, interviewed both my wife and I for clerkship. And she was showing her wisdom even then by hiring my wife and not me. (laughs) And then uh, she married us 25 years ago this year. So it was a particularly painful moment for Mm. my wife, but for all of us. And as you know, for so many here because of what she represented and uh, the the trailblazer that she was. So it's that made it a particularly poignant week Mm. and for so many other reasons as well. One of the things that I think people who knew Justice Ginsburg were upset about is that immediately the discussion became politicized, although that's hard to avoid. And it does take place, her her death took place in the midst of this electoral season in the U.S., which is like no other. And it raises for for us, who are looking at conflicts around the world, all these questions about what might happen, good or bad, in the weeks and months between now and election day, and then between election day and inauguration day, Mm. that could affect uh, issues of war, of war and peace. Absolutely. And I think we've been hearing a bit about the idea of this, uh, the notion of some kind of an October surprise, which I suppose sometimes suggests there might be a positive surprise and other times a, a negative one. What What is your sense, if any, of what we might have in store in the weeks to come on the foreign policy front? Is there is foreign policy, do you think, in play um, for the administration as a way of affecting the this upcoming election? I mean, it's a great, great question. You know, foreign policy usually doesn't weigh that heavily in, mm. in the mind of voters. I think President Trump, he's shown that he wants to chalk up as many achievements, quote unquote, some of them one could consider genuine ones, others far more questionable. So we've had, and we spoke about it a few weeks ago, the normalization between UAE, United Arab Emirates and, uh, and Israel, and now Bahrain and Israel. There's the onset of Afghan talks that we also spoke about. There is this deal, no deal, it's a very strange one between Serbia and Kosovo. All things that President Trump and his entourage would like to show between now and the election to demonstrate the case that he's a deal maker who gets things done. Mm -hmm. Now, the other things and uh, things that could be more worrisome, usually October surprises are associated with negative developments. I'll tell you, and we'll have time in the weeks to come to talk about it. One of my fears has it relates to what happens if if President Trump loses the election, mm. and then he has only a few weeks before then President Elect Biden comes into office and decides to do things to either show that he can still affect the course of history, mm. or to simply complicate his successor's task. And I'm thinking in particular of what he might do on Iran. And uh, again, that's just that's one of the things that keeps me up at night. Mm. Speaking of Iran, one of the things that's happened uh, this week is that the United States invoked the so-called snapback provision of the Iran nuclear deal. At the time that the nuclear deal was negotiated, I was working at the White House under President Obama, and it was a pretty ingenious um, tool that our lawyers and others, uh, other of the delegations came up with, which was a means for the U.S. or any other country to make sure that they could reimpose United Nations sanctions at any time without being subject to veto by any party. And I don't want to get into the details of how it was done, but it was a unique, unprecedented mechanism. What we didn't have in mind was that it would be invoked by a party, in this case the U.S., that had violated and withdrawn from the deal to try to force others to reimpose these U.N. sanctions. We've seen the world as sort of rejected this interpretation by the U.S., but you're an international lawyer, you've studied these kinds of things. 
Does the U.S. have a case? Yeah, so I think this is one of those areas where not the proudest day for my profession in terms of the way that the uh, U.S. lawyers have crafted the defense of this position. And I would say, uh, I think, I, I don't, of course, speak for any friends and colleagues and former students in the Office of the Legal Advisor at the State Department, but my sense is it had to be difficult to write uh, the note that Ambassador Kelly Craft shared with the Security Council on the 21st of August, providing the international legal justification for the U.S. position. It is it is a painful document to read, I think, for many international lawyers uh, in the sense that, so without getting overly technical, the argument, as I understand it, is essentially this, that the Security Council Resolution 2231, which annexed the JCPOA to it, to the resolution, and essentially some have called it a codification of the JCPOA. Um, some have said it is it was an effort to sort of instantiate the JCPOA in as a broader obligation of all states. The argument is that there is a paragraph in that resolution that preserves the ability of a JCPOA participant as a standalone term to initiate the snapback. So that's in, for those that are interested, in paragraph 11 of the resolution. So the U.S. argument is essentially that the term JCPOA participant is completely unrelated to the idea of the words JCPOA participant, which as common sense human beings, we would understand as states that are participating in the JCPOA. So the argument is we, the U.S., may or may not have decided as of May 2018 to cease participating in the JCPOA, that different thing, which is an agreement uh, or a political agreement, they would say. But Regardless of that, we, the U.S., remain a participant for purposes of the Security Council resolution, which enables us to activate and mobilize the snapback. So it is a highly, highly technical argument. But even as a technical argument, I think it is a very weak one. Um, and so far, the response of states, including major U.S. allies, including key members of the Security Council, is total rejection, right? A sense that this is simply not a tenable approach to international agreements to both want to argue that there are no obligations on the U.S. to continue to implement the agreement and that the U.S. can mobilize and activate the, the um, enforcement elements of that very same agreement. Well, it wouldn't be the first time that lawyers are asked to <laughs> argue no. a case that they may not sure. fully believe in. You know, coincidentally or not, this happens uh, as the General Assembly Week at yes. the U.N. celebrating the 75th anniversary of, the, of that institution. It is somewhat ironic and, and sad that you're going to, this, does this create a precedent where different uh, yeah. members of the Security Council are going to challenge the wording and interpretation of the words of, of certain deals, agreements that have been passed? But we have seen, I assume we've seen worse and we'll continue to see things like this. But it is interesting that the rest of the world, including countries that are closely aligned with the U.S., like the U.K., have uh, flatly rejected the U.S. interpretation much will depend now on whether President Trump wins re-election, in which case there is no more nuclear deal, the JCPOA, uh, as, as it's known. And if Vice President Biden wins, he is committed to rejoin the deal. And I would assume that he would then say, sorry, I don't know what my predecessor did, but uh, we don't believe in snapback, uh, that snapback has occurred, that, there, that the sanctions have been reimposed. Anyway, we'll come back to all of this, I'm sure, as the election approaches. We're trying not to be too uh, U.S.-centric, but it's hard these days given uh, so much that's coming out of, of, of Washington. Yeah, absolutely. I would just add, I think one thing to watch in the coming weeks is if the administration moves forward with the unilateral sanctions while the rest of the world rejects the application of those uh, sanctions, one of the I think tension points that we could see arising is if the U.S. steps in to actually implement an embargo on Iran. So if, in effect, the U.S. says we are going to step in to cease to prevent shipments, for example, 
Um, and would this be a potential flashpoint for increased hostility directly between the two countries? So um, we may see uh, from the pages of very technical international legal argumentation to sort of real life potential conflict between uh, those that are seeking to implement these different visions. So yes, much, much to keep an eye on uh, in the coming days and weeks. As I say, much, much to return to. But for today, let's turn to an issue that is very close to uh, crisis groups daily work. And that's the situation in Libya with our very own senior analyst, Claudia Gazzini. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hello, Claudia. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. So, Claudia, as I said, it really is a pleasure to have you. Uh, you you've been working at Crisis Group now for some time, but you actually have been going back and forth to Libya for over a decade. Uh, you now are a senior analyst. You've worked uh, with the UN Special Representative for Libya. I want to start with uh, maybe a very basic question. Why Libya? What, what drew you to that country? Well, I've been going to Libya since 2008 on and off and following it more closely, of course, since uh, the war in 2011. I think at the at the beginning was mere curiosity. I was studying uh, Arab affairs and history of the Middle East, but there was just very little knowledge of Libya. It had been under embargo and sanctions since the 80s. Very few researchers were going there. And I had the privilege of being Italian and therefore being able to access a country where uh, other English speaking researchers and analysts couldn't go to, especially Americans, because of the sanctions. So I had this privileged sort of relation with the country and it's been a strong bond uh, ever since, if not like a love affair, I say, with the country. Well, I have to ask you later on whether you, you regret that love affair or not, <laughs> given, given the travails of, of the country. But now from, the, from that episode to sort of a, a bigger question, which is, for those of our listeners who you know, may wonder, what are Libyans fighting about? I mean, what is, what is it that is making so many Libyans be willing to, 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 to kill and die for? Uh, well, that's a, that's a good question and hard to pin down an answer. You'll probably have many different answers depending on which Libyans you're talking to. Uh, some Libyans would say they're fighting for a democratic state because since the fall of Gaddafi, really the seeds of democracy have not been allowed to flourish. Others would say that they're fighting to prevent the Islamists from uh, gaining hold in, in the country. And others would say they're, they're fighting to prevent outside stakeholders from uh, controlling the country. Uh, I would say that, you know, Libya is a multi-tiered conflict, of course, and, and there are seeds of political rivalry. So indeed, there are factions that have, are fighting for different visions of what the political life of the country should be, meaning should this be a country based on elections and, uh, and democratic rule, or should this be a country that is in the hands of a strong man, because they firmly believe that only a strong man can rule such a difficult country. But it's not only about politics, it's about money as well. Libya is an uh, oil-rich country. It produces is one point in theory, 1.3 million barrels of oil a day. And essentially, the country depends on oil revenues. So there's this big pot of gold, let's say, that people are fighting over because who controls the cash uh, controls the country. So it, there's an economic driver to the conflict that keeps the conflict going. And of course, there are the geopolitical rivalries that also fuel the conflict because uh, Libya is a country where you have uh, the interests of uh, regional states States, uh, Turkey, Egypt, UAE, Qatar, that are being played out, not to mention uh, the more broader Russian versus US sort of rivalries. So it's a very multi tiered and complicated conflict. Claudia, can I ask, uh, in for, especially for those of us who don't know uh, a great deal about this conflict, who are the main players to be aware of right now? Who are the main actors either who are supporting these competing visions that you have laid out or who have other uh, desires for what happens in Libya and are impacting uh, the conflict? 
Yes, uh, somebody used to say that uh, Libya is such a divided country, it's almost atomized in, the, in, the, in mm. how, how divided it is, because every Libyan stands for himself with his opinion. So you have eight million different parties in Libya. But that said, of course, the conflict over the past four years has uh, morphed into a two-sided conflict, mainly between the Tripoli-based uh, government, which is the internationally recognized one, headed by a gentleman called Fayez Siraj, who enjoys international recognition as the head of state of, of this country. And backing him are a series of uh, local actors that uh, profess allegiance to, to this government. Uh, on the other side of the conflict in Libya, there is a, a rival government based in eastern Libya in Benghazi and a parliament base there. But of course, the main figurehead of that camp is a military man, Field Marshal Haftar. These internal divisions between these two camps that both claim legitimacy and claim to be representing the Libyan state have external backers. Uh, we have Turkey on one side supporting the Tripoli-based coalition and Qatar as well, even though in a less forceful way, let's remember. Turkey has openly intervened in the war in Libya, supporting directly the Tripoli-based authorities. On the other side, supporting the eastern camp, we have uh, Gulf states, mainly the UAE, but some Saudi support as well. Egypt, even though Egypt has a complicated relation with the gentleman, with, uh, with Khalifa Haftar, so in the last few months, it's officially still supporting Haftar, but backing more the political uh, figurehead of that same camp, which is the head of the uh, East-based parliament, the head of the HOR called Aguila Saleh. So these are really the, the, the major stakeholders in the Libyan war. But of course, also Russia is playing a greater role now, openly supporting on the ground with private military contractors, Haftar-led forces. So yeah, quite a complicated picture. Well, somebody I spoke to not long ago said in many ways Libya may be the microcosm of the modern w war where you have mm. uh, divisions within the country, fragmentation of the country, proxy warfare, militia on all sides. Uh, and if that's the, the, the shape of things to come, uh, it's, it's, it's not a very, uh, very happy one. But I want to ask you if you, you know, you've, you've been to Libya many times. I don't know, when, when were you last there? Just before the COVID outbreak. So late February, I was there. So not that long ago, when, when you speak to, to average Libyans, uh, because a lot of what you've spoken about is sort of the political elites, the, the, the militia and the outsiders, your average Libyan, what would he or she think about today's situation? You know, are they engaged in these ideological or political or economic battles? Or do they feel like sort of passive victims who are just waiting for, for all this to, to go by? Uh, well, most Libyans, I mean, it's a small population, let's, let's remember. It's about 6.5 million Libyans plus a million foreigners living in the country. So most Libyans would actually say that they are um, just victims of this fighting between Libyan personalities and between external states. There's a lot of blaming the external actors for the current situation. And most Libyans would, would admit that they're living standards have diminished radically since the Gaddafi days. Most of them, you know, over these years have felt definitely threatened. Many family members killed, in some cases kidnapping. I mean, violence on the surge and uh, living standards falling. I mean, imagine this was a country that was uh, sort of Africa's richest country at some point, a place where to where to emigrate to. Uh, and now uh, Libyans feel poor and poorer by the day. But, uh, you know, that said, they blame the local politicians for clinging to power, for being unable to uh, guarantee stability or for improving, you know, ordinary uh, life for them. But because of the conflict this, this past year and a half, let's remember, you know, the conflict actually was an active conflict very deadly conflict in Tripoli, in the capital, where three million people live. So three million people were actually affected by this conflict. And so this has also meant that many residents of the capital have actually um, sort of been brought into the political narrative of the elites of uh, no longer wanting to support those they've been attacked by, referring to the forces of Khalifa Haftar. And even amongst the population in Tripoli, there is this rage uh, against this 
Eastern-based coalition that has felt a sense of impunity in, in launching airstrikes, missile strikes, drone strikes uh, in residential areas against the innocent, what they consider innocent civilians for, for a year and a half. So in the capital, there's a lot of buy-in of the, of the, the rhetoric of the political elites, I must say, yes. Can I ask a follow up to that question, Claudia? I think in in some corners in the U.S., perhaps not enough corners, there has been an ongoing discussion about the idea that Libya, the intervention in Libya represents a kind of uh, intervention that for which there was never a follow up. There was never a sense of accountability for those officials who had supported the intervention, but did not appear to have a plan for uh, for the post-conflict situation. In Libya, is there a sense of of that external actors have responsibility for what is happening now in the country, that those who either intervened initially or continue to do so uh, have responsibility for what is happening now for the falling standards of living, for the increased sense of instability that you're talking about? Um, because the war in Libya has gone through different phases, I mean, there's the 2011 intervention, but then there's what happened after. According to which constituency you you belong to, you mm. turn to blame different actors, right? Mm. So the 2011 uh, intervention, um, uh, if you are a Gaddafi loyalist or somebody who just was happy under the old Gaddafi regime and all of a sudden found yourself having to flee the country, perhaps face sanctions or have assets freeze, uh, so you live in ex- you've lived in exile for the following eight years, then yes, you tend to blame those who led the 2011 intervention, including Western countries uh, and the US and France. Uh, so there's this very strong animosity, and I think the Russians are very happy to sort of echo this animosity and they bring it up all the time as well. Um, but if you're a victim of the violence that came after 2011, and there are many different groups that are victims of the, of the conflict that, that followed, then you tend to blame other constituencies. So for example, if you were kicked out of Tripoli in 2015 because of the rise of Islamist aligned militias, uh, then you tend to blame, start to blame Turkey for for its role in in propping up these groups or, or Qatar. If on the other hand you belong to a group that has been displaced by Haftar forces or has come under siege or has seen, or if you're a Benghazi resident that has been forced out of the city because of your alleged anti-Haftar credentials or simply for not showing enough support to the cause of General Haftar, then you tend to blame the Emiratis, the bad Egyptians, and so on. So whoever is behind that uh, that coalition. So, but of course, you know, at the end, all this blaming, I mean, there's a truth in, 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 in blaming and wanting to put responsibility on the outside actors at whatever uh, point in time uh, you're looking at. But this tendency to blame the foreigners or the outside actors is a way also to um, uh, deflect responsibility on, on uh, Libyans themselves or on certain Libyan political stakeholders. So it's very easy to, to turn the public attention on, on, on the outside outside the responsibilities of, of the foreign community uh, as a way to turn the spotlight away from the responsibility of the Libyans themselves and the corruption, the self-interest that many political actors have in maintaining the state of chaos or, or provoking a state of, of disarray. You are listening to Hold Your Fire, a podcast of the International Crisis Group. Today, we are talking with Claudia Gazzini. Claudia, we are we're in the business of, of conflict resolution. I want to come back to some, some some personal questions in a minute. But for now, let me ask you what you know. What is it going to take to to, to end this war? There's a ceasefire in place, as far as I know. I don't know. You could tell us how strictly enforced it is. Is it a reason to hope that we may be at a turning point? And whether or not we are, what needs to be resolved in order for the the guns to to go quiet? Uh, well, I mean, the good news from Libya is that there's a end of this 15 month war in Tripoli. It ended last June. And uh, so far, you know, we haven't seen a return of, uh, of hostilities in Tripoli. Throughout the past summer, we were fearing that there would be uh, a shifting of the front lines from Tripoli into central Libya. So throughout June and July, we thought that uh, Tripoli based forces would dare advance into uh, central Libya 
Aden to the city of Sirte and the oil terminals in, in the area uh, in an attempt to dislodge the Haftar-led forces that are still in control of, of the central region. Had that happened, then there was a greater risk of internationalization of the conflict because Egypt threatened to intervene if Turkish back forces would go into into central Libya. But uh, a ceasefire was proclaimed, fortunately, at the end of August, 21st of August. But it was a ceasefire that was only declared uh, by Tripoli-based Premier uh, Faiz Siraj and the head of the East Base Parliament, uh, Aguila Saleh. Uh, Haftar hasn't since sort of given signs of support for this ceasefire. But that said, it is holding. A month has passed since then, and we haven't seen an escalation uh, in the central in the central region. So so that's good, and that's in part, I think, linked to the U.S. election uh, in November because apparently uh, the U.S. has put some pressure on both Turkey and and Egypt to hold their guns and and not to provoke a new war in Libya in, in this moment in time. Uh, And so that apparently worked and Turkey has not been uh, actively supporting uh, this offensive anymore. So it's a moment of calm. But I think it's uh, there's a risk of resumption of hostilities after the elections if there's no political agreement and no financial agreement, because it's sort of a lull in fighting and everybody's waiting to see if if this moment of, of temporary peace can provide an opportunity uh, to kickstart political talks and get a financial agreement to reunify this country. So I think that the conflict is not uh, completely off the books quite yet. And so... I mean, you started hinting at the need for political agreement and some kind of financial agreement. In in broad strokes, what would a compromise on the politics and the economics look like in your view that, that could be sustainable? Well, I, I mean, the basic question is, are Libyans ready to form a real unity government? Uh, they've been, the country has been divided since 2014, and there, there's a parallel uh, political structure based in Tripoli, uh, internationally recognized, and another one in eastern Libya that administers that region, uh, not internationally recognized, but they go on doing business as usual. They are parallel military structures and parallel financial structures. So the, uh, the, um, the goal, of course, all these years has been to try to persuade these two rival uh, entities to actually uh, reach an agreement to form a real unity government where, where they're both represented. So the, the question is, are you ready for this? Uh, <laughs> Libya, uh, and, and there's a growing need for this because the, the, the current state of affairs is not sustainable. I mean, people say, oh, we can live with a frozen conflict. It's just better for them not to just have war, but let's, let's leave things as they stand. Well, it's not sustainable, a frozen conflict in Libya, because uh, Libya is so oil dependent. And currently, um, oil production has been shut off. There are no oil exports in the country since last January. Uh, The country has lost some $10 billion worth of revenues, which means that a country like Libya, which is 95% dependent on oil revenues, cannot sustain itself in the long run uh, once it runs out of the reserves that that it currently has. So to kickstart, you know, oil production, uh, you need an agreement uh, to actually implement a financial agreement. And and that means agreeing on uh, whether or not to cover the debt of the Eastern authorities over the past four years. It's a very thorny issue. It might sound technical, but it's about recognizing whether or not Eastern-based authorities have been sort of legitimately spending money over these past four years of parallel administration. It means recognizing their debt. It means reconnecting the two branches of the central banks of Benghazi and uh, and Tripoli. These are the demands that Haftar's camp has made in order to reopen oil production. It's hard to see Tripoli agreeing on these conditions because it actually means conceding to Haftar's demands and and providing a financial lifeline to these Eastern-based authorities, which Tripoli accuses of having sort of attacked the capital for the past uh, year and a half. But when you ask me what is needed, well, this is what you need. You need a settlement that includes provisions in settling what has happened over the past four years and moving forward. And this also means that on the political level, you need a settlement that recognizes that 
the other side is a counterpart to negotiations and possibly uh, reaching an agreement on a new political lineup. It's not going to be easy. I, th I think the odds of this, of UN held talks succeeding are very dim. I've seen various rounds of negotiations over the past four years, participated in some, and they've Everybody goes to these negotiations with goodwill, saying, yes, we support the UN. Uh, but actually, many of these stakeholders just want a seat in power. And uh, once you start negotiating who gets to be on the presidential council, so who gets to go on this new unity government lineup, that's when the real fighting starts. And I, and I don't, based on the track record, I don't expect uh, anything positive to come out of uh, this new round of, um, of talks that is set to start online, unfortunately, because of the whole COVID blockage of, of travel. So it's it's quite unfortunate that the odds are so low because living standards are really deteriorating in Libya. We have electricity shortages, 12 hours, 24 hours a day, water shortages as a result, cooking gas, people can't afford it. Inflation is going, is skyrocketing. So um, Libyans really need a political and a financial settlement to move on. Well, I mean, it is really tragic the, the way you describe it, such a wealthy country and such poverty and such such misery. One of our trustees, who you know well, Hassan Salame, who you worked for and who uh, used to be the, the, the UN envoy, had this expression saying Libya is a, is a unique case of a country that is uh, self-financing its own suicide. What you say is, you know, reason for pessimism, but we're in the business of trying to produce at least or to provide some reason for hope. What is the or more ingredients that are missing? Is it a matter of getting outside actors like Russia, like Turkey, like the US, like the UAE on the same page, pressuring their respective allies? Or is it something more endogenous to Libya that, that needs to change if we're going to, at some point, as we have to resolve this conflict? Well, I mean, in theory, we could say that, yes, there needs to be an international convergence on Libya, been there, done there, and there's a lot of hypocrisy in, in, in the capitals involved in, uh, in the Libya conflict. So they say something and do something the next day. And we've seen how, while professing to support a political solution, uh, some countries have continued to pull weapons into the country just the day after. So yes, there needs to be an international convergence. But I think even from the Libyan side, there, there needs to be greater acceptance of the other. Yes, okay, you've been at war. Uh, you've and, and the various sides have different readings of why they are at war. Uh, they have different rationales to explain why to uh, support one uh, faction or the other. But at heart, at some point, you need to move on and um, listen to the reasons proposed by the other camp and sort of accept to pardon, accept to consider the other side a legitimate counterpart. I think this is still missing amongst uh, many in Libya. They haven't, uh, they're not ready to, to, to move on yet, despite all the suffering that uh, they see and they live around them. Claudia, can I ask a, a question that uh, I, I know can sometimes seem a bit perhaps obnoxious to, to country experts, but uh, it is part of the debate, I think, more globally on Libya to the extent that the initial 2011 intervention represented for some a important example of the Security Council and the international community stepping in to stop atrocities, uh, and for others, a an example of catastrophically poor planned uh, external intervention yet again in the MENA region. Looking back now in 2020, is it your sense and the sense of those you're speaking with, and I know you, you addressed this a bit earlier, that it it was a mistake that that the 2011 intervention and everything that flowed from it uh, overall provided an opening for a new Libya or that it, it sort of led to the the kind of misery that you're describing today. I remember Rob asked me this question one day in Tripoli. It was 2012. And at the time... Uh, it's only one we, year after the revolution. Well, only one <laughs> that, year after soon. the revolution because, you know, I, I was the one that uh, was very alarmed by the war of 2011 uh, and very skeptical that this would lead to an, an orderly settlement or uh, give rise to a, a sort of a new uh, rosy Libya. And uh, in a cafe, I remember in 
Tripoli, Rob was asking me, you know, well, everything, you know, everything seems to be calm. We're here, we're visiting. Uh, so what do you think, Claudia? You know, do you still think that 2011 was a mistake? And at the time we were, Libya was about to go into its first election. So things seemed positive. And I remember I told Rob, I don't know if Rob remembers, I said, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's still too early to, to judge and to, and to say uh, how this is going to end. Now, fast forward eight years, 2020, and I think that honestly, we can all say that uh, the the balance of what happened in in twenty eleven is negatively uh, against the calls for intervention. I mean, uh, yes, this um, Muammar Gaddafi was overthrown, but the chaos that ensued, the the death, the level of violence, the the suffering that the country has gone through, uh, is unprecedented. And I think you know, perhaps an orderly transition, a negotiated transition back then would have been possible. I mean, was talking about introducing a constitution, you know, or have a, have a political opening. No guarantees of success, but I, I still think that we could have avoided uh, a lot of the violence and, um, and the conflict and destruction, infrastructural destruction uh, that has ensued. Well, that's, I think that's really a uh... A warning for all those who still entertain uh, visions of regime change, wherever they may be. But that's uh, that's sort of a sad conclusion. But Claudia, I want to, I really want to thank you. Thank you for 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 being with us today. Thank you for all the work you've done in Libya. And I know you're itching to go back as soon as as conditions uh, permit. We'll be, wait for you to to go back and report. And you could tell us what you know what what's next on your on your agenda. What are you going to be working on on Libya? Maybe you want to. Give us a, a a little taste of what we should be expecting. Yeah, um, I mean, we're working on, you know, the state of the play in Libya, where we stand in terms of conflict and the prospects of a, of a political solution and what needs to take to move from this state of frozen conflict to an actual uh, path towards unification um, or post-war sort of reunification. Uh, of course, we're looking at the oil sector as well because of these negotiations uh, about restarting oil production so that continues to be a focus of our uh, of our attention and the more sort of regional rivalries that are being played out so that's a lot actually but that's a lot i can't i can't wait i can't wait but uh thank you again really a pleasure having you hold your fire a podcast by the international crisis group and with thanks to Claudia, Rob, before we close, I wanted to ask you, uh, what should we be reading this week? What is Crisis Group uh, published that you've, you'd have you like to draw our attention to? So very quickly, three three pieces. One, uh, a, a question and answer for anyone who is still not entirely clear about what the U.S. just did with its snapback on Iran. And we had a great team of our U.N. and Iran experts who are answering those questions on behind the snapback debate at the U.N., a commentary on uh, violence in, in the southern Philippines, something that people may not follow that closely, but a very, very interesting analysis of what is behind the uptick of violence. And then finally, related to the discussions we just had about Libya, a, a statement, a crisis group statement about how to defuse tensions in the eastern Mediterranean, tensions involving Turkey, involving Greece, involving Cyprus, involving France, involving Israel and tensions that could lead to confrontation between uh, a member of the of the EU, Greece, and a member of NATO, Turkey. Fantastic. Lots for us to, uh, to talk about in the coming weeks and months. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you for listening to Hold Your Fire. If you have any questions, send them to media at crisisgroup.org, and we'll be happy to answer them. Have a good week, everyone. Hold Your Fire a podcast by the International Crisis Group.